Hoppo, I just want to thank you for joining me and taking part in this journey that I'm going on in my 13-week triathlon program. And I would like to get some feedback from you on some of your input on the VO2 max test as well as the periodized program that I'm going through. Wonderful. Well, thanks for having us part of the journey, mate. I mean, it's really it's inspiring for us to see someone in our community who... I didn't realize till I spoke to you that you'd never done not only a triathlon before, you'd never done the individual disciplines before. So, I mean, I think it's really cool you're doing this, and I'm grateful to be part of it, so thank you. Um, what, there's a few things I want to do, mate. I, I, I think this is a really cool topic. Um, you've been at our mentorships. You've seen us present. We think that energy system development is something we've kind of really lost in our industry. And one of the key things that we're going to flush out in this conversation is the power of understanding ESD. So you are on a 13-week program. We're in week nine. Yep. So you've done an awful lot of your, your program that you've perfectly put together. I've been through it. But what's really important is you've gone and had a VO2 max test, and you've had your anaerobic threshold and your maximum heart rate assessed, correct? Yes. Excellent. So I think what we should do is flush out for our community three things. No surprises to the community. <laughs> Number one, what is VO2 max? What is anaerobic threshold? That's the first thing in very simplistic terms. Number two, how do we now use these concepts, these direct gaseous measures, to actually understand energy system development? So what are they? How do they impact on our understanding of ESD? And third, let's change the program. It has to lead to a tangible, right, a measurable outcome. So I want to go through the last four weeks of your program, applying what we now know based on your um, lab work. Is that cool? Perfect. All right, mate. All right, let's start with VO2. Your VO2, from what I've seen in your, in your lab stats, was 59 milliliters per kilogram per minute. All this means, your VO2 max, we should think of as the size of your engine. How big is your engine? If you're at 30 mils per kilogram per minute, it's this. If you're 59, it's this. And we have initially, for many decades in exercise physiology, thought that VO2 max, the size of your engine, was the most important determinant in aerobic success. What we're now learning in the last decade and a half is that, yeah, it's important. Make no mistake, in an endurance environment, what you're in, if you've got a 60 size engine and your competitors have a 29 size engine, there's a really good chance you're going to outperform them. Where that doesn't hold true is what if you've got someone who's got a 55 and someone who's got a 60? Does it make the 60 better? No way. No way. Because there's this thing called anaerobic threshold. Now, the first thing about anaerobic threshold is it's used interchangeably or synonymously with ventilatory threshold, lactate threshold, and anaerobic threshold. They're not exactly the same thing. And I think it's beyond the discussion of today to go into that. What's important to know about anaerobic threshold is this. The most important thing, it has the most ridiculous oxymoronic name of maybe anything in our industry. <laughs> It is the most misleading name in our industry. It's called anaerobic threshold. Guess what it measures? Tell us. Your aerobic capacity. <laughs> <laughs> Your anaerobic threshold is a measure of aerobic capacity. How interesting, huh? We hear the word anaerobic and we think, oh, it means how much work can I do anaerobically? No, it doesn't. Here's the size of your engine in you. Let's round it up and say, 60 mils per kilogram per minute. Your anaerobic threshold was at 35 mils per kilogram per minute. As a percentage, it's around about 59-60%. So if this is the size of your engine, from zero down here to max up here, your anaerobic threshold kicks in around 60%. What does that mean? You start going predominantly from an aerobic capacity, shifting into anaerobic. It doesn't mean it's your max anaerobic work. It does not mean that. That's why the names are very misleading. Yeah. Why is this important to know? This is why. It means that everything prior to that threshold, you were predominantly in an aerobic capacity. 
Once you start shifting into anaerobic, what kind of things start to happen? One, you start to produce more metabolites associated with anaerobic metabolism that may impair the continuation of, of exercise, like carbon dioxide, like lack muscle lactate production. Now, it doesn't mean the minute you start producing these more that you're going to crash and burn. It doesn't mean that. That's why we have lactate threshold and we have ventilatory threshold. What it means is you're shifting gears. This is the most important thing. The sooner you shift gears from aerobic to anaerobic, the less likelihood you are you're going to use the size of your engine to your best ability. If your anaerobic threshold kicks in around 50%, that means halfway through the size of your engine, you're starting to go into higher gears. We can't live there for too long. We're going to run out of gas yeah. quicker when we go up the gears. Make sense? Oh, yeah. This is why we talk about a very important phenomenon called pushing the threshold to the right. What it means is, whatever the size of your engine is, you want your anaerobic threshold as close to max as possible to give yourself a better chance of shifting gears. Because ultimately, if I could stay in a, a, a lower level gear where I'm aerobic, and my competitors are higher up the gears going anaerobic, I got more gas left in the tank. I have more gears to still go up. When I go put my foot down, I can. They're already at a higher gear. And that's in a simple analogy, using a car in this example. Size of your engine is VO2 max. Anaerobic threshold is an almost a measure it's a measure of aerobic capacity. It shows you where you're shifting gears. And once you start going into the higher gears, you're gonna crash and burn eventually, you're gonna run out of gas, and it's harder for you to now shift back down into gears again. That's a very important visual construct in our mind when we talk about what this is going to do for you. So does that kind of make sense about what you've had assessed? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I will say this. Your VO2 max is actually really, really freaking impressive. I mean, 59 for a non-endurance athlete is actually very high. Just give you a quick comparison. Do you know World Cup soccer players are usually between 54 and, and 60 mils per kilogram? <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> There you have it. Now, when you get into very competitive and almost professional elite uh, endurance athletes, it's in the 70s, sometimes even up in the 80s. Some of the highest known athletes out there are ultra endurance, like marathon runners, Olympic rowers. Believe it or not, Olympic rowers have some of the biggest lung respiratory capacities of any athletes out there. And actually, cross country skiers tend to show up as the biggest. So we're talking about total body movements, which is not surprising, right? Yeah. And they're in the high 70s, some even in the early 80s. So you're, you're up for a, an everyday, you know, gym user who's new to endurance. You've got a very big engine. Right. The thing that flagged up for me is you, go in, you change into the anaerobic threshold at around 60%. We need to push your threshold to the right. 